Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are on site at the American Anthropological Association's annual meeting. We are now sitting down with Dr. Deborah Thomas. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it, I'm very excited. We have a lot to talk about. Deborah's background's awesome. All right, here it is. She is the she's AAA's editor in chief of their journal, which is American Anthropologist. She's a professor of anthropology at University of Pennsylvania, core faculty in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. She got her PhD from NYU in 2000, and she's interested in political anthropology, sovereignty, violence, the afterlives of imperialism, transnationalism, diaspora, race and gender, performance and popular culture political economy, and the Caribbean. There's, what are you not interested in is the better <laughs> question. Uh, she taught at Duke for four years in cultural anthropology. F- is it a four-time author-ish? Some, yes. Ish. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. many, so many different publications I'm excited to talk about and also work on some film as well, two films, mm-hmm. two films. Um, and she's the director of the Center for Exper- Experimental Ethnography um, at the University of Pennsylvania, which opened just about six months ago. And it's right there. So I'm really excited to talk about all of this and get to know you better. Let's let's di- let's dive into understanding, you know, who you are. How like who are you, who were you as a kid that led you to become an anthropologist? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I never woke up one day and said, oh, I want to be an anthropologist. I completely fell into anthropology. Um, I was a dancer, actually. I was a professional dancer in New York for many years and had been trying to think about what's next. And the dance company that I performed with, which was Urban Bushwomen, we did a, we had a research to performance methodology and we also did these community-based projects where we would work with different grassroots organizations in a city where we would go on some kind of project that would use music and dance to generate something else. So whether it was, uh, you know, um, we worked in New Orleans, for example, with a basketball team that needed math tutoring. And so our task with them was to up their grades in math worked with a community bookstore and some of their literacy programs. We worked with a welfare rights organization on empowerment and knowing, you know, knowing people's rights, etc. Um, so, you know, that kind of process was really interesting to me because for me, dance had always been a way to understand bigger political questions about the worlds that we inhabit, you know. So I thought maybe I wanted to do research like that, but on a higher level, like what are the are there situations in which that kind of work was done not just at the local grassroots level but at a national level and uh, in Jamaica dancers were very involved with the anti-colonial project and so I was interested in how they did that how they attempted to transform people's ideas about their own cultural practices what was important about them um, the institutions that they set up in order to train young people in the various dance forms that were no longer just ballet and opera and classical music, but in fact had a grounding in Jamaican, Afro-Jamaican tradition. So that's how I ended up back in school, but I had applied to, I didn't know anybody who uh, had gotten a PhD, so I started polling my friends and you know trying to find somebody who I could talk to you know about that and eventually went and visited with a friend of mine and you know one thing led to another. I ultimately went into a Latin American Caribbean studies mm-hmm. master's program and one of my first classes was with an anthropology professor and I just like fell in love. Good. Well, okay. Now, as a as a dancer, um, this is this is very interesting. Do you still dance today? Not really. Like in the living room. With in my the kids. living room with your kids, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. At yeah. wedding. Yeah, me, know, yeah, likewise. Like yeah, that. likewise. At some every events now and, and then stuff. At a every club. now and then. Yeah. First, <laughs> but so teach us about you know before we get to you know NYU and stuff, um, and and even past that, what what was the uh, dancing for anti-colonialism. Teach us mm. about that. How does that, what is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, throughout Africa, some places in Latin America, certainly the Caribbean, and some places in Southeast Asia, the 1950s and 1960s was really a time of 
political ferment. You know, it was the moment that a lot of uh, nation states who had been colonized by European countries were questioning that political relationship and were fighting to overthrow colonialism in Algeria. That was a war. You know, it was an actual fight like that. Um, in some of the British colonies, it wasn't uh, a military episode. It was a gradual process of transition toward decolonization and independence. So one of the things uh, that happened in many of the British colonial territories is that really bright young people would get scholarships to go and study at Oxford or at Cambridge, right? And so there were a number of people who had artistic training in Jamaica and ended up in Scotland or England um, and then they ended up learning folk dances in England. And then they started to wonder, you know, why don't I know my own folk dances? We must have folk dances in Jamaica. And so for them, I think it really started a process of mm. questioning what they had been taught in terms of the superiority of British culture. Um, and, you know, kind of provoked them to look more into their own indigenous history and their own Afro-Jamaican traditions and to valorize the African part of the Afro-Jamaican, which would then allow them to see what are the practices that were brought during the transatlantic slave trade to Jamaica, adapted to the local environment, that really sustained people during the period of slavery. Right? So they ended up doing a lot of research um, into the history of those practices, into the ritual shape of those practices, into the rhythms and you know musical instruments of those practices and then for dancers of course into the dances and so then they would take all of that material and transform it for a concert dance stage you know incorporating it into performances as the National Dance Theatre Company of Jamaica so it was really an attempt to sort of change people's minds about the values the value of their traditions what a unique way to augment perception through through dance and mm -hmm. theater um, and especially because there is so much richness in the culture of dance and theater across the world but also that there it's a very important story to tell about what happened in the transatlantic slave mm -hmm. trade um, but the numbers are so huge it's like 12 and a half million Africans were moved across to uh, all over. All over, yeah. yeah. Latin America, yeah. Caribbean, yeah. The United States, States, Canada. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <clears throat> that's like, that, I think that's the largest migration, a uh, forced migration in the history of the world, yeah, I think. I would assume, I assume so. Yeah. Wow. Um, so now, okay, now, as but we then, just, But yeah, then it's ahead. like, what do you. You know, I mean, the thing I think that's special about um, theater also, music also, artistic representation, you know, visual art as well, but dance in particular, is that, you know, one stores memories in the body, mm. you know, and one marks social relations and histories through the body also. Mm. So these dances are not just sort of movements undertaken for a kind of ritual effect, but they're also, you know, a store, a storehouse of history. It's an archive, you know, it's an archive of, you know, personhood, an archive of the history of a community, an archive of the social relations of the community, and also sort of life-sustaining tools you know, in context of great degradation. So when people practice them today, they don't necessarily know those long histories, but in practicing it, they're still participating in that tradition. Not everybody still knows those languages, you know, but in singing the yeah. words, they're still invoking that long tradition. Yeah, you, know, so. you feel it through your body yeah. when you watch. We, we had the uh, Pacific Islanders in San Francisco doing their dance yeah. and it was so just the energy was so strong coming from them and it was just sinking through us and we were observing the culture that has that, that the dance that has progressed through yeah. them over time and it's just yeah. been it was very interesting and yeah. yeah dance is a unique medium in that sense I think so and like then there's like that Australia and New Zealand have that 
Wait, is it just New Zealand? Yeah, has that, has that, the, the, their rugby games or whatever they do that like not the like create like like, uh, like a very aggressive dance. Uh, um, I don't know. There's that, <laughs> and then there's there's yeah. Th so, okay, because um, I think we're actually going to end up talking about that a little bit more as as we keep going on. What what was your thesis on at NYU? Mm -hmm. Uh. My, dis my PhD yes. dissertation? Yeah, so it really was about that. You know, what were, how were artists involved in these anti-colonial movements? What were they trying to do? What kinds of institutions did they set up in order to transmit that to other people, both in terms of the schools and the dance, com the performance companies, or the theatrical companies? Um, and then also, you know, how did that change over time, right? Jamaica got independence in 1962. The National Dance Theater Company was formed in 1962. But that practice in 1962 is very different from what's going on in the 70s, from what's going on in the 80s, what's going on in the 90s. So I was interested in how new generations of performers coming through might have configured their purpose differently and why, you know, what it was about the changing reality on the ground that pushed a different vision artistically. Um, and also then, you know, as artists, I think we have, you know, a healthy hubris about our influence in the world. You know, we feel like we can change the world through art, you know, and through performance. But of course, many people remain unchanged. So I was actually quite interested in the extent to which people who weren't involved in those movements really were attached to them. You know, did it actually change people's minds? Were people interested in these Afro-Jamaican traditions, which are largely rural traditions? You know, what people in the city, do they care about that? You know, and if they don't care about that, or if they only sometimes care about it, when do they care about it, you know? Is it only at Independence Time where we have the National Festival and all the school children do their performances or is there some other sustained kind of relationship? And then if they don't care about it at all, what do they care about instead? You know, so what do they feel actually represents themselves as Jamaicans better than the National Dance Theater Company or better than what they're learning at the School of Art or, yeah. you know, and, and what I've you know, one of the things that I found was that, um, you know, clearly by the time we reached to the 1990s, um, dance hall culture has sort of taken over in terms of a public expression for young people of what it means to be Jamaican. You know, it wasn't really any longer these kind of country traditions that seem to them, to many of them, to be backwards. You know, not something they would do every day, but dance hall you live every day. You know, it's blasting from every car stereo, it's on every corner and the big speakers. And, you know, so that, um, you know, I was interested in how that popular cultural representation became the louder manifestation of Jamaican national identity by the, you know, by the 1990s, early 2000s. Of course, there have always been popular expressions of Jamaicanness, right, but um, easier to suppress in earlier moments. And I think by the 90s, it was just louder, you know, and there was no way to really control it as perhaps people had tried to do in the past. So. And the, the theme of the dance uh, was a, a lot of the time anti-colonialism? Well, I mean, that wasn't an explicit theme in the dances per se, though there are certain um, pieces of choreography that the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica did and developed that, um, you know, were explicitly addressing the political situation yes, yes. or telling those that story of decolonization. But in their own research into the, the sort of traditional Afro-Jamaican music and dance forms all over the island, right, because it's different practices in different parts of the island, mm -hmm. that was a kind of anti-colonial move because to that time for middle class people, you know, dance was ballet. And, you know, you certainly didn't dance barefoot. And definitely there was not a drum in the dance studio, you know, so they really inaugurated mm -hmm. a sea change in terms of what was acceptable artistic production on a concert stage, you know, so that was a, 
you know, it seems odd now because that's so normal, but at the time it was a really radical thing to do because it was changing the cultural orientation of the audience, you know, or it was intended anyway to change the cultural orientation of the audience. And it grew a lot over 60 to ni 60s to 90s. There was just, you said different parts of Jamaica picked it up and started having their own sort of dance. Well, there was a um, festival movement that really started in the 50s, right, where um, people in all the different towns all over Jamaica, school children, would develop a dance or a performance or something that they'd compete then at the local level, at oh, the parish cool. level, and then those winners would come into the city around the time of independence and there would be a big competition, you know, and you would choose the best the best dance, the best monologue, the best play, the best song, you know, those kinds of things. And so that was one way that people showcased, you know, what are the traditions all over the island, you know. But other what companies... What is the style of dance? What there's lots of different styles. And there's, like you said, there's they added like a drum and that was new and there's... You know, well, it's new to middle class people on a concert stage, yeah. but these traditions existed all over the island yeah. you know, prior to that, but, th but un unknown to many of the city people, you know, unless they came from rural areas. So, you know, different forms in different parts of the country. There are two areas of Jamaica that are maroon populations or maroon communities and maroons had fought for 150 years against the British army and won and ultimately Whoa. signed a treaty with the British that granted them sovereignty over their own land. So those folk have their own traditions called Coromanti and Whoa. they have particular rhythms that they play on the drums. They have a, a horn which is called an abang and they have certain mm. things that are played on the abang and different songs that are played. But you know, in each pocket, depending on where people had come from and how they adapted their traditions, these kinds of practices developed. And there's a practice called tambu, there's one called dinkimimi, there's pokomania, there's lots of different um, things that developed both during and after the period of slavery. And after slavery, the sort of big one that developed was called kumano. So. It's a 450-year fight against, for four-year land against the British, whoa. 150. 150. Yeah. What year yeah. did that start? Oh, when did they sign like, the treaty? It was really most of the 18th century. 1800. Yeah. And some of the, the end of the... 150 The British took years. over um, Jamaica from the Spanish in 1655. So sort of from just past that period into the 18th Interesting. century. That's one thing about anthropology that is ridiculous is just the amount of complexity of people fighting for land and mm. w fighting wars for land mm. and resources and whatnot. Yeah. Um, okay, so so now within the studies that you're like really focused on, uh, wait, wait, you had a period of time that you were professing afterward at Duke. Right. Is that where you went after? After NYU? my PhD? Yeah. Um, not immediately. I went first, uh, I had a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at Wesleyan University, mm -hmm. uh, which is in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So I was there at the Center for the Americas for a couple years, teaching, doing research, etc. And then I got the job at Duke in cultural anthropology, and so I was there for four years. And then it was to University of Penn after that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. Because that's been, you, how long has it been this, at Penn now? It's like. Uh, we got there in 2006. Okay, so 12 years so 12 there years. and four years at Duke before that. So it's, it's a lot of teaching. That's like 16 years of, of <laughs> well, teaching. Sure. I mean, there are people here who have been teaching for 50 for, years. Yeah, so. that's right. There's lots. Yeah. Of, exactly. Yeah. Now, now, now teach us about what was being taught, what you were teaching at Duke and what you're teaching at Penn. And um, let's ask about what you were teaching first, and then we'll ask about like what it was, what's been like with the students as well. Sure. Um, gosh, I don't remember what I was teaching at at Duke all the time. Um, you know, often I teach an undergraduate class on the Caribbean, you know, culture and politics of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, where we introduce students to Caribbean history and politics and economy and. Um, 
you know, they read ethnographies that are, you know, contemporary ethnographies about what people are doing research on today. Uh, I taught a political anthropology class. It wasn't called political anthropology, but it's a class I also teach at Penn. It's called Race, Nation, Empire. We're really thinking about the formation of the modern world um, and how that's tied up with these histories of imperialism and slavery and racial formation. Um, I teach intro now at Penn, mm -hmm. Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. So and what does one learn in, in that class? Well, hopefully one learns something about the diversity of humankind and yeah. learns something about um, the way anthropologists have come to categorize people. Um, and, s and the history of that and sort of new ways to think about uh, those processes. Hopefully one learns um, something about um, the ways people organize their families and how we think about some of the classic themes in anthropology like kinship or exchange. Uh, or creolization, cultural contact, you know, how people over the centuries have sort of interacted with each other over time. It's, you know, yes. Classical and anthropological yes, things. Yes, yes. You know. and, and what about the current focus on uh, gender, sexuality, and women's studies? Mm -hmm. So, what about what's really important for? people to know about that today? Yeah, it's such a huge field and yeah. such a diverse field. I mean, my own interest um, is always, I mean, I've, I'm interested not only in what women do, which is often how people think about women's studies, but in how all of the processes that we study have gendered dimensions and gendered effects. So, you know, I do a lot of research, sorry, I do a lot of research on uh, violence and nationalism and globalization yeah. so I'm interested in how those processes also come out of and mobilize or reproduce or challenge particular gendered ideas about what men are supposed to be like what women are supposed to be like what men do what women do um, how families should be formed or not formed and you know it comes into contemporary issues for example related to LGBT rights and you know how how a nation state wants to control you know people's sexuality or open up controls previously held controls around people's sexuality so I think for me the the focus on um, gender is really uh, an analytic focus like how do we look at everything in the world as having something to do with gender right just as yeah. you know how do we think of everything in the world or every process that's going on the, in the world as being racialized you know that we don't you know race is not a kind of meta problem of sort of neutral processes like liberalism you know, but instead to know that liberalism is built through racial ideas and ideas about race and the classic sort of English framers of liberalism are theorizing politi political democracy at the same time as they're thinking through property relations in a context in which slaves are, not cons are considered to be property and not humans. So we have to understand democracy as something that is already built on certain social and cultural foundations that have at their base racial and gendered divisions. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's really, I, that's, that's an important variable to calculate of race and gender within all of the different constructs and aspects of, of society. So what have been some of the important takeaways and like learnings from looking at things in that le through that lens? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think, you know, one, one uh, perhaps becomes thought of as an iconoclast, but if, if, if we say it often enough, I think it, it starts to be recognized as, as true. But so, you know, I think one of the things in this country that um, 
often happens is that people want to ignore race or they want to see racial discrimination as sort of a, an individual failing or an individual problem and not a systemic and structural issue that has a historical context, right? So people want to say, for example, that we're post-racial, right? Um, and I think if you, if you take a long historical and anthropological view of political history and, and global political economy, then what you actually come out with is, okay, all of our modern institutions are forged in the crucible of racism and racial discrimination and the transatlantic slave trade, if we're thinking about the Western world, right? And if that's so, that means that our contemporary political institutions, economic institutions, etc., are all coming out of that infrastructure that was created, you know, from 1492 onward. And so it, we can't escape it. We have to think about it, and we have to confront it, and we have to track it. Not in a linear way, you know, oh, because of this slave law in 16 whatever, now we have this. It's not like that. But to understand that all of our modern institutions are really rooted in that history means that we can look at different kinds of solutions that are structural and systemic rather than just individualizing the problems that we face today. Yeah, yeah. And what would be some of the some of the some of the good solutions that you have in mind for us to 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 be there's a root level the root level causes of some of the systemic issues that we have what are some of your solutions to some of those mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you know so many people propose the important solutions we already know them you know it's like massive structural change that will actually equalize opportunity for everybody, right? Yeah. Um, and certainly, um, you know, funding for education, funding for for kids to have after-school programs, you know, leveling the playing field, creating pipelines. I mean, this is stuff everybody knows, and you know, people choose to do or or not do. And certainly, there are diversity programs in pretty much every corporation now. And then we see the kind of changes with respect to sexual harassment policy. I mean, people, people know what to do. It's uh, what, you know, structurally and systematically, people know what to do. So it's a choice to do it or not do it. But I think on the interpersonal level too, um, you know, that is more difficult and that requires a different kind of commitment and it requires a commitment to having diverse social groups, you know, um, and I think despite everything, most people don't, you know, most people kind of stick with people they understand and people they know, and it turns out that their social uh, collectives aren't quite as racially diverse as the country is, for example. And so I think, um, you know, there's the sort of internal, experiential, psychological side of racism or gender discrimination that really takes a lot of internal psychological work and yeah. interpersonal work and that has to happen alongside the structural changes yeah. you know in order to create the broader change because you know as we see with governments and shifting policies policies change and maybe um, maybe things open up you know but people's minds change a lot slower so I think and that's I think what we see today in, in this country, too, is a kind of backlash against some of the structural changes that have happened because people's minds and hearts haven't changed. Yeah. yeah. It's a deep process of getting into our hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's <laughs> deep. It's a deep, long consciousness shift. Yeah, yeah. for sure. What about these books that you authored? Political Life in the Wake of the Plantation, Modern Blackness, and also um, co-editor of Globalization and Race. What, what, are, what are really important, oh, exceptional violence as well? What are the theses of, <laughs> of these books? Yeah. Well, Modern Blackness is really an adaptation of my dissertation, 
Uh-huh. So you know the answer to that already. Yep, yep. <laughs> Um, exceptional violence came out of um, something that happened in the in the community uh, that's you know one of the focus sites in modern blackness where that had been the community where I used to live and that had been a community where members of both political parties lived side by side without problem mm -hmm. and in Jamaica there's a kind of long history of political violence um, between the parties that gets mobilized especially at election time and during the 1970s that political distinction was mapped onto broader Cold War distinctions and it became a kind of communist versus capitalist sort of argument um, that obviously has dissipated uh, with the end of the Cold War, and yet this kind of system of political um, curry favoring, you know, persists, right? Anyway, so this community was one in which um, it was not a homogenous community politically, and people had strong relationships across the political boundaries, and it had always been like that, and there are some communities like that in in Jamaica and um, the basically the week that modern blackness was released there was a gang war that developed in the community that sort of developed along these political party lines linked with other communities in Kingston and um, one of the kids that uh, was in a theater group that I had um, developed while I was doing my field research um, was killed in this in this war so that book emerged from my investigation into how how and why would this have happened now when you know for 40 years this has been a peaceful community you know what is it that made this kind of violence flare up in this community at this time and what is the history of that violence you know because when we experience these moments of exceptional violence hence the title Sometimes they seem like sudden and unexplained flare-ups and like they come out of nowhere, you know. And so in that book I'm trying to show, well, it comes out of a much longer history of violence um, and to track what that history is and how it continues to circulate both structurally and through popular culture, music, novels, films, etc. And so there's, you know, there are, there are things that catalyze a kind of flare but the conditions are always there, you know, and to talk about that as the history of the West, right, and the legacy of the West. Uh, the volume, uh, Globalization and Race, came out sort of out of a conversation with a friend of mine who's the co-editor of the volume, Kamari Clark, um, just wanting to bring together a number of scholars who were thinking about those issues. You know, there had been a lot of scholarship at the time about globalization, and what that what what that meant, you know, what what it looked like, uh, what the effects were economically, you know, and politically, and also in terms of people moving all over the globe to find work or keep work, and corporations moving all over the globe to find cheaper costs and cheaper labor, yeah. and um, so there was a lot of scholarship on globalization, very little of which was really attuned to. Um, you know, what was going on in terms of racial dynamics, you know, was this exacerbating already existing equalities or is there potential for overcoming some of the racial problems that have happened. So we just wanted to bring together a number of scholars who are working on those issues in different sites to sort of see what com kind of conversation, you know, that would be. And so that conversation ended up being a book, <laughs> being an edited volume. and with articles, chapters from all of these other scholars, and then we wrote a framing essay as the introduction. Did globalization end up in exacerbating racism or decreasing it, ameliorating it? Uh, you know, it, it, everything is complicated, right? Yeah. So in some, you know, what I see, or what I was seeing at the time in my own research was um, that, you know, on a structural level, if we're looking at indicators, you know, as the state retreats from uh, investing in certain social goods like education, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, it makes people who are already precarious more precarious. So on that level, it has a 
deleterious, you know, um, effect, and whoever is already marginalized within a population becomes more marginalized, and that's usually black folk, right, um, and poor whites, you know, but in different ways. Right. At the same time, um, in my little corner of the world, you know, what was going on um, was that uh, the people who were coming of age around the time of independence, they were in that community dependent on middle class people for access to certain things, jobs, um, letters of invitation to a school, a better school for their kid, um, you know, uh, admission to a loan service or, you know, things like that, that middle class people served as the happily, you know, in, in a committed way, served as brokers for the working class people in that community. What that meant was, you know, there was a tightness of relations, you know, across class, but it also meant that they had to perform their class roles, you know, there was a deference that was expected to the middle class people in order to uh, convince them to act on, on their behalf. You know? And I don't say that, that, that the relationship was false, it wasn't false, but it required a certain kind of class organization. Right? So fast forward you know, 30, 40 years, those people are now in their 60s or, you know, in the 90s and 2000s are in their 60s. Their children have migrated, largely. I mean, migration increased exponentially and partly it's because people need to go elsewhere to realize their economic dreams or, you know, to get the education that they want to get or get the job that they want to get. So there's a push, you know, for the migration. But that also means that now these migrated children are sending back money, remittances, they're sending back goods, they're sending back clothes, and so their parents who had previously been dependent on the local middle class are now getting what they need from their kids who are abroad. Very right? interesting. So it means that they don't have to do that deference anymore, right? Yeah. So it's complicated, right? So, you know, they're now sort of more autonomous, more self-sufficient, what that also means is that the ties that bound classes together in the community have weakened. Oh, wow. And it means that some of the middle class people stopped being involved in community affairs. There was more fear and suspicion on both sides. You know, so all of these things have very, Whoa. you know, not only double-edged swords, but like quadruple-edged swords. Swords, yeah. yeah. Whoa, so um, a family can have uh, some of its offspring go t overseas to maybe a more economically prosperous area, earn money, send it back home, and then the family, they have stronger ties to maybe the middle class um, for just, just, in just integration-wise. Now they can, as a lower class, can step their economic stage up and yeah. then create potentially weaken those ties between the yeah very yeah. very interesting yeah. so these are the these are these are the interesting stories of globalization that I don't think get discussed often enough well because people are dealing with policy people are dealing with macroeconomic issues people are dealing with numbers you know and I think the beauty of anthropology is that you're really getting at the nitty-gritty because you're following people you know, and you're trying to understand the intimacies of people's social worlds. So, you know, your numbers aren't big in terms of what other social scientists would call a sample size, yeah, yeah. you know. But, um, but the depth of the relationship and the length of time that one spends working on these issues generates a sort of a very complex, um, you know, I was going to say bird's eye view, but it's not that really. It's a you know a complex emic perspective on on what the effects of some of these big macro processes are, and it allows us to understand the very complex and sometimes contradictory effects that processes have, so that we're not surprised, you know, when it mm -hmm. when when they kind of turn into policy events. You know. Yeah. Th so then there's almost a there's a benefit from a very bird's eye perspective on how resources are flowing and what it, what's going on between maybe two countries. Mm -hmm. But then there's also a very 
large benefit to going into having a just behind someone's eyes individually yeah. with their family and their relationship with people around yeah. them yeah. and then all of a sudden you're actually learning that their offspring is making more money in the place sending the money that yeah. kind of thing yeah. yeah and to see that those stories are different <coughs> in different places you know there's no one effect of globalization you know it looks yes. different here from there from there from there so there's no one sort of policy universal that's going to make sense everywhere or even in sort of humanitarian efforts for example you know if one really looks at as many anthropologists do really looks at you know how that works in x location or y location you know you see it's very different so imposing a policy solution you know across territory without regard for local differences historical differences etc oh, totally. you know th it doesn't work yeah. so. sadly policymakers yeah. don't don't consult anthropologists that often that would be that's a very powerful uh, combination uh, policymakers and anthropologists policymakers like ethicists mm -hmm. there's there yeah, there's a lot of important combinations uh, artificial intelligence engineers and ethicists or anthropologists, <laughs> yeah. you know, these, yeah. yeah. And anthropologists do work on all that stuff, too. Yes. I mean, that's what's uh, nice about the field is it's very broad, it's very eclectic, it's a big, giant tent. It is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I feel very at home here. It feels very good because yeah. I'm such a multidisciplinary person. This is a very multidisciplinary yeah. show. We say we're disciplinarily promiscuous. D disciplinarily <laughs> promiscuous. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, I was called an undercover anthropologist. Ah, yeah, <laughs> disciplinarily go. promiscuous. That is so funny. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good one. I want. What was what would be the one with like, with a, po po like, po d disciplinarily polyamorous or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. something like that. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah. let's let's ask you about your about relationships with teaching because as you teach, you have students and you teach them across this information. You know, you're learning from them; they're learning from you. What have been some cool takeaways for you from this process? For me, yeah, um, well, different at the undergraduate level from the graduate level. Of course, at the undergraduate level, um, I mean, it's just really beautiful to see that light bulb turn on. Mm -hmm. You know, and to see it happen in the classroom, to see someone find their passion, you know, which doesn't happen like all the time. You know, yeah. not everybody wants to be an anthropologist or have that kind of a take. Excuse me, have that kind of a take on the on the world. But um, when you see it, it is lovely. You know, and we do have a couple. I have had undergraduates both at Duke and at Penn who are now my colleagues here you know, who got bit by the bug. That's so cool. You know. Um, <laughs> now they're here. They're your students. They're here. They're, they're yeah. professors yeah. elsewhere. That's they're so now cool. teaching their own students, you know, yeah. which is quite lovely. But if even they don't go into anthropology, once that light bulb turns on, yeah. you know, they could take it in any field, you know, the students who are filmmakers now or mm -hmm. who are artists or, you know, who are doctors or, you know, but they have a sensibility that yeah. they carry with them, which is nice. Grad students are different. Um, I learn always a ton from my grad students and the kind of intellectual and social relationships we have are really valuable mm -hmm. to me because, you know, we're working through material together I have more experience at it than they do, but they always bring fresh insights to stuff I think I already know, yeah. you know, and, and I learn from their research projects, you know, when they're out in the world doing their field work and they're sending back, you know, a monthly, this is what I did this month and these are the questions that have come up or when Whoa. they're thinking it through, when they're writing their dissertation mm -hmm. and you get to read it, you know, it's, um, you learn about you know, I don't do research in West Africa, but I feel like I know quite a lot about it from students who are working there or, you know, other parts of the world. And that, I think, is, you know, really lucky. I literally pinch myself every week and say, yeah. I can't believe that people pay me, you know, to do something that I love. Yeah, I was I was loving how you were explaining that graduate students will send you a summary of what they're working on and you get to just like, dive into what they care about in that moment. You're learning about where they're at, what they're doing. Yeah. Um, couple quick thoughts. 
You have some films that you've worked on, yep. um, and then you have um, the Experimental Ethnography Center now, mm -hmm. Center for Experimental Ethnography. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know something that I think we talk about on the show a decent amount, but it's geopolitics, mm -hmm. and I'm curious what you've seen with China's investment into Jamaica, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. Africa. What have you been, because the relation, China-Africa relations are very interesting, mm -hmm. um, and there seems to be a big geopolitical push for who is going to be supplying the growing economies with their socks and underwear <laughs> and toothpaste and stuff like well, that. Well, and who is the new, um, you know, political entity that's extracting minerals and, right, because that's, yeah. I mean, in many African countries, that's the principal reason for Chinese investment. In others, it's infrastructure development, it's roads, it's hospitals. Mm -hmm. In the Caribbean, it's mostly infrastructural development and um, toward a diplomatic uh, agenda, which is um, to get more Caribbean countries to recognize the PRC rather than Taiwan, because there are a number of Caribbean countries that are still allied to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So every Caribbean country gets a vote in the UN, and the PRC has a one China policy, uh. so that some of their activity in the Caribbean is really geared toward that diplomatic shift that Should they want that, to yeah. see happen. In Jamaica, and well, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, there's a long-standing Chinese presence. There are a lot of Chinese who came over in the late, eight, late 19th century, early 20th century as migrant laborers. Um, in Jamaica, many of them went into retail grocery, uh, made a variety of innovations into that field, uh, became the shopkeepers in every rural town. Um, in Jamaica and, and subsequently developed a kind of a monopoly on the bakery industries and other kinds of industries. So there's a long-standing community in Jamaica. So this new group of Chinese who are com coming over, it's created some interesting dynamics because on one hand, um, you know, what it also represents is a decline of U.S. investment in Jamaica, especially after the financial crash in 2008. Um, and so where the U.S. diminished their investments, China stepped up, and that sort of, you know, was part of the beginning of a process where you were seeing more and more Chinese interest. Um, they have invested in the bauxite industry in Jamaica, which is the raw material for creating aluminum. Whoa. And that's always been a kind of contentious, who controls bauxite, bauxite. in Jamaica is very yeah. important, and the U.S. was very interested. Whoa in the 1940s and 50s because of the Korean War and they were requiring you know, closer aluminum stores mm -hmm. um, than what they were getting it from before. So, um, you know, so on the other hand, on one hand it's an opportunity. There's like you know. infrastructure development, like you were saying, yeah. is it? but then I mean, there's also mineral extraction. We have a new road extraction. that's, you know, beautiful. And that was built by the, by the Chinese. So on one hand it's an economic opportunity for the country um, to court this investment and see, you know, what kinds of alliances can be made. On the other hand, people experience it as a, many people experience it as a kind of new imperialism. Not the same political imperialism that European countries did and that the sort of, you know, soft and not so soft American influence politically uh, has been really from the 60s onward. Yeah. But uh, an economic imperialism and one that carries with it a kind of racism, people feel that they're being treated poorly by, by a new Chinese coming in. So as with every new process, it generates both um, excitement and anxiety. And so I think it's, it is an interesting thing to follow throughout Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa right now because it really speaks to a contemporary shift in terms of a global political economy and moves us, you know, moves us into a very new dispensation, you know, away from the kind of dominance of the West towards something else that's going on, and we don't know where that's going to end up right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. It's geopolitical malleability, and yeah. 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 Um, last thought about the current state of humanity and mm -hmm. about maximizing human potential. What mm. do you think? Oh, what do I think about yeah. maximizing human potential? Uh, what I think is that I can only have an impact on that in my own small world, so I tried to maximize the human potential of my students, <laughs> my undergrad students, yeah. my grad students, and certainly my own children. Yes, I tried yes. to give them, you know, the opportunities to think big, you know, and to, and to 
to be curious and to really investigate a question until you get to the end of that road. And sometimes that road takes a long time to totally. get to the end of. So for many, you know, for all of us who become anthropologists, I mean, these are lifelong questions in a way. You're constantly trying to answer a different iteration of the same question that you started out with because each step you take, you get a little further down the road. You know? Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us Thank on the you. show. This has been very enriching, and there's still so much more to understand <laughs> and, and unpack. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks. Thank you. It was Thank great. you. It was such a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Also, check out Deborah's bio and link down below. Also, AAA's link down below. Give them a look. And go and build the future. Manifest your destiny <laughs> into the world, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Thank you. <laughs> Thank that was you. so fun. That was fun. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are on site at the American Anthropo Anthropological. We're gonna redo that. <laughs> All right.